one of my first uh, works in planning. This is a little town in Andalusia, in the, in the province of Granada. And it's a town that is uh, built in a ravine. And the whole uh, town is uh, related with this fantastic natural and urban space. And uh, we work changing the use of the ravine that was used mainly as a sewer for uh, we, we work with the engineers in order to transform the ravine. And then uh, when we change the, the, the ravine uh, use uh, as a garden, uh, all the uh, architects, uh, self-architects of the town, change the facades and embellish uh, the, the, the whole town. So it's a good example of how a natural space can become uh, also a, a good urban space. This is an example that um, all of you know. This is La Ramblas in, in, in Barcelona. That is actually Ramblas means a river in, in Catalan uh, or, or in the Mediterranean countries. And it's, it's a, a good example of a transformation of a geographical network or a green network into a social network. Maybe one of the best uh, examples of social uh, spaces in the Mediterranean. No? And these are examples of my work in the Master Plan of Madrid in 1985, before the, the Master Plan uh, that uh, uh, Javier Arpa showed today. Uh, we we try to, to work with the idea of uh, reconstructing the city that came to us from the result of the, the dictatorship of Franco. So we work with these uh, uh, drawings, trying to understand what was the, the, the what I would, would call the hidden landscape of the city. And we discovered that all the infrastructure and the trees and, and the monuments and the gardens uh, were related with the geographical shape of the city. So, so we began to uh, understand these areas and to use these areas because they were public land and where uh, the way the structure of the city was organized. And this is a, a recent example of, uh, I have been working in, in Madrid. Uh, this is maybe one of my last projects. This is the uh, a, a cattle road. I don't know if it's the right name in English. A cattle road is a, 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 a path that uh, moves the cattle from the north to the south. It's, maybe 600 kilometers long uh, all, all, all over the peninsula. And what is interesting is that it's not far from the area that Javier Arpach showed in southeast Madrid. No? So you can see here the, the, the empty uh, development and the infrastructure of some of these big areas. But not far from that is this uh, cattle road that has been occupied by 40,000 uh, people uh, Romanians, gypsies from all, all over uh, that uh, uh, are part of the economy of the city and they have developed this system using public land because the cattle roads were public land si since the 12th century and transformed the whole system in a new lineal city. You know? So that brought to us some uh, ideas of how to develop the, 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 the empty areas that were not far from that. No? This is an example of different scales of this uh, system of cattle roads. And this is using uh, Charles Eames' approach of the uh, uh, scales, uh, how the whole system was self-organized by, by, by the people. Uh, here on the right hand side, you see two pictures. The upper one is the density population in China, and the lower one is the uh, suitability for agricultural production. And you see, they overlap very much. So you get a lot of questions from uh, the metropolitan, the metropolitan governments, but also from industry. Can you help us with uh, the knowledge you have and how you produ produce food and how, how we put? I can take elements of it that can help of the, of the, of the designing new food systems. <coughs> the 
concept as well, but how to implement this in practice. And then we see three main issues here coming up. One is the production agriculture, that's more the efficient one. Uh, we see the developments of urban agriculture and ecological. And we think that these three should more or less be in balance. They are not in balance, for example, if you only fo focus on the profitable one, of the, of the efficient one, that will not be accepted if you want to uh, apply it in the local situation. Same accounts for here, if you only look at urban agriculture, you can never provide food for a complete urban, uh, a complete uh, metropole. And uh, outside the urban area, when we, have, when we look at the ecological one, for example, the organic agriculture, uh, we don't have enough land to produce all the food in that way. So we, somehow we need a balance in that. That is what I called the metropolitan agriculture, the connection between these three. They have different business models. I will come back later to that. First, I want to give some, uh, some basic rules. I see that uh, production uh, agriculture is more for the city. I see that the urban agriculture is more in the city. And the ecological one is more or less around the city. That's the basic one. It's not always true, but it's a rule of thumb. And they all should be profitable, in our view, but they also should be in balance with each other. As I said, uh, we use three uh, business, three different types of uh, business models here. First one is improvement. What I, what I mean with improvement is that uh, the output of our production uh, food chain might be the input for another one. So in that case, you don't have waste, but the waste becomes uh, a new uh, uh, input, a new resource for another food chain. If we look at valorization, we look at uh, can we enlarge the existing markets, uh, diversification, for example. If we look at different stages of, of urban uh, consumers, they need different types of food. So can we valorize in that way? And of course, the last one, innovation, is come with complete new food, food products or food services. Uh, I want to talk about the role or agency even of uh, ecology or ecological process in reimagining cities, uh, existing cities, former cities, future cities, cities never yet to come. By exception, I also want to talk about our role as designers, as urbanists, more as choreographers of these dynamic processes, uh, of curators of design scenarios that might play out over time. Now you all know that um, ecology, ecological thinking, has undergone a radical shift in the last 30, 40 years. I learned ecology is always wanting to achieve a steady state or equilibrium. Every little meadow wanted to grow up and be a mature forest. And that things like wind and fire and hurricanes and all the things that actually happen in the world were uh, aberrations. Um, these days, though, ecologists think about change as the norm. Right? Change is always happening. There's a lot of stuff going on uh, at all times. And it requires a different mindset, a different thinking then in terms of how we deal with natural and ecological systems, even in uh, urbanized places. Now these uh, issues have been very much part of our thinking uh, for a number of years now. Um, when dealing with uh, situations where we're engaging landscape and engaging dynamic process, this is some work for uh, a very simple, small ecological park a few years ago. Um, rather than beginning to think through what were the scenes, the pictures that we wanted to make, uh, we began to think through what were the possible futures for this place depending on how climate changed, wind changed, uh, environmental conditions, even bureaucratic uh, conditions might change over time. And so we began to devise a set of possible future scenarios uh, and then began to think through what is it that we put in place? How could we define the conditions to allow for these dynamics to unfold over time? Maybe just uh, open um, 
with a question to Chris, because I think what he showed um, happening, uh, they work in Detroit, was pretty fantastic in terms of this kind of ambition of understanding uh, urban processes not as fixed, but evolving and transforming over time. Um, obviously, time is a, a characteristic that you take into account in sort of developing a project like that. But I'd be interested to know or discuss, I mean, in essence, Detroit is a, a sort of situation that one could characterize as having failed. And now, in, in sort of that failure is what is being responded to. Um, in the work, is the expectation or is there anticipation of additional failure? How does failure as a thing, maybe not specifically to that project, but in general, the way that you're working, uh, whether it's in Minneapolis or um, uh, elsewhere, how does failure build into the way that you begin to understand those uh, development of those systems? Well, it, it, first, I might um, challenge the word failure, but. Um, only because I, I, I think what you see now are s entire cities like Detroit or parcels like the ones I was showing in Minneapolis, simply in a s different state of being. Sure. Um, in some ways, they're still urbanized, right? There's still people around. Um, uh, there's still um, infrastructural service systems that are there to support uh, what's going on, problematically, of course, because the in Detroit, the problem is that the infrastructure and services overscale to the um, current population. But I think for us, it becomes a, a new set of conditions, right? Um, how is it that we take this seriously as a legitimate state of being, a legitimate form of urbanism, and then begin to reinvent it? I think for Detroit, the, 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 the kind of knee jerk has been either uh, urban agriculture is gonna save it, well, that's a lot of land to turn over to the community gardens, right? Or you simply put it back to nature and let nature take its course. I think for us, you know, it became much more provocative to, 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 to begin to think a lot deeper about what the specific issues were on the ground. In fact, you have neighborhoods where there may be one or two um, um, uh, houses on a block, for instance, and that became a different kind of uh, situation, a different condition to be able to that we needed to be able to respond to. We couldn't control all these conditions, right? Uh, we needed to take them for granted, take them as is, take them as legitimate starting points for what might be able to happen. And, and, and in doing so, you know, we could open ourselves, open others up to the idea of different forms of use, different forms of production, different forms of urbanization, I would argue. Um, than what you would might normally see in the city. I mean, to Rania's point earlier today, um, there is no longer a distinction, say, between what is city, what is metropolitan, what is suburban, and what is landscape beyond that. Here you have, in some ways, an inversion of that, a reclamation of landscape back into the city, but they remade in an urbanized form. Um, I found your presentation with strategy and aspect design fascinating. Um, my question now is uh, how do you go into reality with, with that? Uh, I think that the, all, the, all the ingredients that you were showing were extremely interesting. I would like to see that done. How, uh, yeah, how do you uh, deploy that uh, in reality? Uh, I think on a number of levels, uh, one of the things we've talked about is uh, distributed decision making and distributed um, responsibility for the types of initiatives um, that we were suggesting. Um, in fact, we think uh, that we're able to um, help define, say, and, and even implement a series of demonstration projects that would begin to show people what, what the hell we're talking about uh, on the one hand. Um, but in, in the way that we've set up the project that says, well, you know, you have a set of conditions, and if you have that set of conditions, then you can do A, B, and C. That essentially puts the decision making in the hands of many, many other organizations, groups, mm -hmm. uh, philanthropists, grassroots people, entrepreneurs, a neighborhood that wants to do detailed level planning for their specific neighborhood. We've essentially given them a how-to manual of, of how to think through what that process might be. So it, it, it's going to happen on a number of levels. Just tying it back to some of the, uh, the, the maps and plans that you were showing, Daniel. I mean, a lot of those, um, and obviously it's, it's 
of, the, of a time, um, but were quite figural in the way that they um, nested within the city, that you had, um, uh, you had the, the sort of edges that Enrique was, was talking about earlier. Um, I wonder, I mean, in, in essence, does, within those figures, maybe another way to ask this is, the processes that Chris is laying out have the capacity to produce that figural form. They have the capacity to produce that kind of framework structure that is, in fact, legible. Um, and I would sort of maybe pose the question to both of you, is that legibility essential? Do we need to see that structure on the landscape, or is that something that can be sort of eroded and hidden uh, and, and sort of disappeared? The, the, the last drawing that you showed with the kind of orange arrows suggests something more, suggests something more muscular in some ways, but you seem to go out of your way not to show that. Whereas in Daniel's projects from earlier uh, with the Madrid, there's a clear designation of some of that structure. Uh, I, I, I uh, really don't understand the whole question, but I, I will answer some of Seems to be a pattern. the parts. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think uh, uh, the difference with what uh, Chris uh, showed uh, in, in his presentation, uh, with my presentation, is uh, I, I, I emphasize uh, a lot the, the relationship of uh, the city as, a, as, as history and culture. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that the, the process of uh, building a, a city and, and uh, the innovation that you can make in the cities and now things like uh, urban agriculture will be thought as a, a, a innovation even if in the old cities, in the uh, pre-urban cities there was always a, a strong relationship between agriculture and, and cities uh, is something that has to be developed through uh, a, a, a very uh, let's say soft and uh, uh, still time uh, organization because I think uh, uh, it has to be support because it, it it's needs the, the, the understanding of the citizens and the people in order to organize the whole system. No? So I, that's my main concern when I um, designed this presentation uh, with what has happened in the last uh, years in Spain. No? Most of the projects I have presented are uh, from the time of the, uh, let's say, speculative bubble. No? But of course, the authorities didn't take in account at all. I think the first uh, people that were left out of the system by the administration, the Spanish administration, were the urban planners. No? I remember that I began to uh, work as a planner with the left uh, uh, municipalities in Spain in the 80s. And then in 85, already, even the left uh, administration were saying that what we were saying about these kind of things, they were not interested at all in other. That, that they were too, too, too slow that they didn't bring a progressive uh, economy and things like that. So uh, my, my idea is that we should return to the, this uh, early approach that is a <coughs> traditional approach. It's not, nothing very new. And uh, combine all these uh, different activities. And, and, and that's uh, what I, I wanted to, to present. I don't know if I have answers to I, uh, for me, legibility is very important. Um, um, I mean, I talk about process, but I'm, I don't want to get into a debate about form versus process. That was a kind of 90s debate. It was a false divide, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, 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 I think legibility is, is clear. We heard this, actually, at a very pragmatic level, we heard this, to say all the kind of, you know, all the emergent meadows, all the kind of successional forests that we were seeing in Detroit, for instance, uh, we could get excited about, ecologists could get excited about, residents saw it as blight. So the idea of marking, of being very specific in the way that you mowed or maintained or did not maintain a property, 
the offense was something that very clearly marked the site as intentional. It was very, very important. But I'd say you take that all the way up to the kind of um, future scenarios that I was showing in those illustrative axonometrics. There is a lot of form making in that. The, the, the point was to make legible uh, both underlying and new patterns on that landscape that could begin to lend distinction to those types of places. So some of the planners, some of the engineers that we were working with, for instance, on the big lake proposal kept wanting to redraw our plans as this big, smushy, soft, wet, muddy kind of naturalistic looking thing. Uh, but but the, the, uh, you know, first of all, that kind of marsh can exist. That's a pre-urbanization marsh, an idea of a marsh that can no longer exist there. Also, to make that would cost so much money and expend so many resources. What we were doing was something that was very deliberate, very strategic. We were cutting through the roadbeds where there were existing infrastructures only in minimal and strategic ways. The roadbeds then became the pathways that people could use to access these new nature areas. And the slopes were very highly controlled in order to produce the kind of um, uh, vegetation that we were looking for, right? All in the guise of something that looked very deliberate in terms of what its figuration was. I mean, I, the, the, reason I, the reason I asked the question is a bit goes back to the conversation that we were having in the first panel about the idea of modifying the network or modifying the system and whether it's the modification of the entirety of it or it's the sort of point of intersection or at very specifically local conditions. And in some ways, I read your answer as being legibility is not important at the macro level, but legibility is important at the kind of, um, from a sort of perceptual level as it's experienced. That the way that it accumulates uh, as urban form is less essential in terms of the way that it accumulates as spatial recognition within the location as you move through the city. That, that understanding that it's not blight, but it's intentional, understanding that it is um, a, a controlled or a constructed or a surfaced, a modified ground, uh, as opposed to something that is just emergent, um, that's the critical end of that process. It's not that it accumulates into something that we can take a photo of or we can kind of put on an aerial photograph uh, on a screen, but that those things begin to locate themselves within a kind of urbanized territory. And as they accumulate, they produce a form of the city that comes from a very different direction than the way that the form of the city that we were seeing in Madrid was, con was conceived, which was as a whole, as a totality. That it's about the accumulation, it's not about the sort of the stamping of the city as, a, as an influence. Yeah. Question for Daniel. Um, I, I, was, I was also fascinated by those plans that never were, <laughs> that you were showing us in the 1995. Do you think that uh, given the situation right now, and this is not only for Spain, but uh, let's uh, talk more globally, do you think that uh, this moment of pause of, uh, of, uh, of, let's say, low rhythm uh, will make policymakers understand the kind of planning that you were proposing in the 80s? Is there any chance, any room for that? <laughs> No, it's a difficult question. I don't know. I don't, I don't see a, a big changes in the in the ideas about. Uh, I mean, from from the administrators, no? how to uh, organize the decisions in a different way. No? I really don't see. I don't see that uh, in what I know better than this Spain. No? I think uh, still. They are repeating the same errors, maybe because the, the strength of the uh, developers and the global economy is such a big uh, uh, force that cannot deal too much with these ideas that are considered uh, not too interesting for them. No? Uh, let's say, for example, um, I don't know. I I, I, I am a, a, a pretty pessimistic, really. <laughs> Be, because uh, I think, uh, 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 for example, in Spain, uh, we, we can see uh, uh, when when we began to work as urban planners in the late 80s or in the early, yeah, in the 80s. Uh, 
uh, urban planning was part of the of the programs of the uh, politicians. No, I think that there was a, a whole discussion about uh, uh, planification, about participation of the people, about the innovation of the cities, the rehab of the old structures and things like that. And uh, very fast, I think in less than five years, all these issues were uh, put away. And uh, economic issues began to be uh, the, the, the important uh, uh, issues and the important decisions. No? And uh, a lot of the culture of urban planning, and of course it was uh, in some parts of it uh, were uh, very erroneous, uh, especially the, the, the very tight modern urban planning. Uh, they were not considered at all, and then uh, direct negotiations between, as you show in your uh, first uh, presentation, between the developers and the administration was the issue. No? For example, uh, the, 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 the leaders of the municipal cities from the left and from the right, they didn't take in consideration the decisions of urban planners at all. So I, I don't see uh, a change right now. Not in the minds of the developers, not in the minds of the administration. And until the administration doesn't take in account that some kind of, uh, let's say, progressive urban planning should be part of the issue, I don't think it's going to be any change. 